The rest of you folks, I want you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of St. Luke. And my Christmas message is God uses the little things. God uses the little things. Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 7 right through to verse 16. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 7, and we're going to read right through to verse 16. So let's please stand up for the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse number 7. And she brought, that she is Mary, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, the Mashiach. This shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, the city of bread, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary, and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. God uses the little things. Let's go to the throne of grace. Our Father and our God, as we consider this subject this morning, this Christmas message, Father, may it be indelibly stamped on our heart and on our mind. And Father, learn that principle, how you love to use little things and little people. Father, anoint this preacher with feet of clay. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, folks say that you can hardly travel through Rome and Italy without being impressed with the work of Michelangelo, that great painter, that great sculptor and, and uh, uh, artist extraordinaire. And most visitors come away from there being a real fan of his. It is said that one day while he was working on one of his paintings, a friend stopped by and he looked at it to admire it, but then he left. Days later, when that friend returned, he noticed that the little or no progress, progress seemed to have been made on that painting. So we asked Michelangelo, he said this, he says, Michael, why haven't you been working on that painting? You've been here so long. The great artist replied, I have been working on that painting day and night. His friend said, well, it doesn't look like you've been doing much. I can't see any changes or additions to it at all. Then Michelangelo replied this. He said, well, I worked on a person's little finger for a whole day. Imagine that, a little pinky. And then he said, I carefully worked on the earlobe for another day. That's this right here. Grab your right earlobe. One whole day, Michelangelo worked on that. And he said, also, I worked on a little wrinkle of a face for a couple of days. Now, I don't want you looking in the mirror if you're getting my age. All right? But can you imagine, beloved, for a couple of days, just a few little lines of crow's feet on each eye. His friend didn't ask this. He said, Michael, why in the world do you spend so much time on such trifles as this? Michelangelo looked at him. The great painter replied. He said, my friend, it's trifles that make perfection. And he says, don't you ever forget that, for perfection is no trifle. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, listen, what's he saying to us? He's teaching us this. He's teaching us that the principle that this oftentimes lies in the little things that comprise the big things. In other words, beloved, he's telling us that in the little details, the little minutia, the finer parts and points of something, it's those things that end up comprising the whole masterpiece of something. Now, the prophet Zechariah spoke about this in his book. He said in Zechariah 4.10, he exhorts us, he says, Despise not thou the day of little things. Now, a lot of people do despise the day of little things. We have a tendency, beloved, to overlook and ignore the little things. Many times we take the little things that come into our life for granted. 
What are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying this, beloved. I'm saying that we often overlook someone who may give us a little nudge or a little hug or a little wink or perhaps a kind word that can and does ultimately end up making a great impact on our lives, beloved, especially when we're down, especially when we're discouraged or depressed. Amen? Now, you hear me. These little gestures that show that we care, oftentimes, beloved, I over the years, they give great encouragement and comfort and cheer and hope to those who feel lonely and down in the dumps. In other words, it means the world to them to know that somebody out there really cares about them, really thinking about them. You know, uh, we don't realize, we come into church sometimes, everybody seems to have a burden, amen? And I can tell you as a pastor, I'm involved in all their lives. They do. Everybody has problems, including this preacher. So none of us is like that. But I want you to hear me. All the big things that we see and use are made up of countless little things that we don't see. For example, I've told you to always look at my big door. That little hinge on that big door is what makes that door usable. But instead of looking at the hinges, what do we look at? We end up looking at the door. And beloved, all of us have cars right here, but it's that little key that turns the ignition that makes that big car go. But what do you look at? That's my car out there. But your car out there would stay out there if you didn't have your key in here. Amen? And you see, beloved, we often overlook that little money that we may have left over in our pocket because we say, oh, man, I need a lot of money to pay my bills. But yet you still paid your bills and you still have a little bit of money in your pocket and you ought to look at that and thank God for it. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, on and on and on it goes. I'm saying that it's all the little things that make all the big things in our lives possible. Now listen to me. I find it really interesting as I read this Christmas story, the greatest story the world has ever known, that God chose a series of little things to bring it to pass. Little things like incidents, little things like events or tasks, Little things like people in places, beloved, to give us the Christ story, how Christ, the Messiah, the Messiah, that long awaited deliverer, was finally coming into the world. I'm saying you can't read Luke's story about Christ's first advent without noticing or being impressed with the fact that there's nothing. I mean, there's not one thing here that man calls bigness, not one thing here that any of us would ever call prominent or notable. There's not one thing here, beloved, that you and I would call outstanding or important in this story. And yet with such a fantastic and real event of this often awesome magnitude, most of us would expect it here, but there's none. Zero. Zilch. Nada. No big things. The whole story is comprised of a bunch of little things that hold things together. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, I want to speak to you this morning on three profound truths about how God uses the little things. Now, I want you to hear what I said to you. God uses the little things. Now, that's totally contrary to what the world does. The world looks at the best resume. Who has the most experience? Who's the best looking? Who's the one that can do the job the best? But that's not the way God looks at things. God uses the little things. Would you say amen out there? Now, the first thing I want you to see is this. Little things glorify God. Little things glorify God. What do they do? They glorify God. Look at verses 8 through 15 again, beloved. I want to read this portion of Scripture. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a magnitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass... As the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Beloved, surely 
as we look at all the big things, the big things here like the angels, the big things here, beloved, like the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God that shone round about. The big things like the heavenly host and the announcement of the Messiah had now come. Beloved, the big things like the vast breadth and expanse of the universe and the earth, surely all these things bring glory and praise and honor the God as the creator of them. There's no doubt about that. But so too, beloved, does the lowly birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, there were many rich and wealthy men living in Palestine at this time. The Bible teaches that. In fact, Nicodemus and Josephus could have fed Jerusalem three meals a day for ten years. That's how uh, rich they were. And there were about a million people living there. So there was many prominent, many rich people living in Palestine at that time. And beloved, there were many uh, learned rabbis and scholars living in Palestine at that time. And there were many notable scribes and Pharisees and holy men living in Palestine at that time. And you see, beloved, these men, these holy men, they left their joys and their comforts of home, and they went out to the desert, and they lived an aesthetic uh, uh, lifestyle, beloved, in the deserts, in the caves. They fasted, they prayed, they gave themselves over to glorious religious exercises, all of these in Palestine, beloved. And people knew who they were, and they were highly respected. These were the monks. These were the holy men of God. If God's going to appear to anyone, surely it should be to them. Amen? But that's not what happened, is it? You see, beloved, you hear me now. It was not to them that the angels appeared in the heavens. Their ears did not hear the celestial angelic choir sing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. God in his wisdom did not choose to send his angels to sing the message to those who taught in the temple and those who taught in the synagogues and perhaps the seminaries there in the synagogues or to the learned men or to the aesthetics or the rich and holy men who dwelt in the deserts to fast and pray. Beloved, you think about it. The greatest news, the greatest story that was ever told was heard by simple, lonely, and despised shepherd. They were considered the off-scouring of society to be a shepherd. But yet God appeared to these little men, those considered to be unimportant, those considered to be insignificant and irrelevant, those considered to be the outcast and the marginalized of society. Yet God bypassed the great and the prominent and the important men, beloved, and instead, what did he do? He chose these little lonely men to hear his great angelic announcement and song of praise about the birth of his son, a song of praise about the Savior of the world, not just the Savior in Israel, but the Savior of the world, would you say amen out there, which is Christ the Lord. Now, beloved, I want you to look at verses 13, if you would, in verse 20. Verse 13, it says, And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Drop down to verse 20. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Now, beloved, this is unbelievable, isn't it? So both the angels and the shepherds we're here giving glory to God, praising God. You see the eyes of the great men, the eyes of the noble and the wealthy men, the eyes, beloved, of the very respected people, the well-off people, the well-to-do people, those who everybody always looked up to. They didn't hear that. They didn't hear the angels praising God. They weren't able to praise God like the uh, shepherds were with that great announcement, Amen. You see, beloved, they were not allowed to see the great wonder of God in the nocturnal heavens. Can you imagine it being dark out and a few twinkling stars? Then all of a sudden the sky cracks open and the glory, like a spotlight, shones that shines down. Shones down. <laughs> shines down. Now, beloved, these uh, other people weren't allowed to see what was happening there in the nocturnal heavens. And they were not privileged to see the bright stars and the lights right up in the sky. And they were not permitted to see God's heavenly hosts and angels, but the eyes of the little lowly shepherds were. You see, folks, 
It wasn't the ears of great men. They did not hear the angel's message of good news that the Messiah, that long-awaited Messiah, beloved, 4,000 years had finally come. Now, you would think you'd tell it to the rabbis, you'd tell it to the Pharisees, you'd tell it to these prominent men, someone who had the ear of everyone else. But yet God didn't do that, did he? You see, God doesn't normally work like that. We do, but God doesn't do it. You see, the ears of the great men do not hear. The angels say, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And the ears of great men do not hear the angels singing and praising God over the birth of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of the world. Only they alone heard a multitude of the heavenly hosts singing and praising God, beloved, and speaking glories up in the night sky. I want you to picture yourself. You're one of the shepherds. There's your sheep. They kind of settle down for the night. Things are kind of quiet. And all of a sudden, you hear an angelic choir. How do you think you treat them? <laughs> Wouldn't that stun you? Beloved, I would say I am the most blessed. I'm the most privileged person to ever see. So who would ever believe that I had seen something so magnificent, so great as this? Amen. So God chose to appear to these simple men, these lowly shepherds, the so-called nobodies, the nothings of society, if you will, beloved. What are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying God uses the little things. Come on and say amen out there. God uses the little things. That be you and me. You see, God chose them to bring him glory. But there's more little things that God used that night. I want you to look, if you would, at verses 4 through 7. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Behold, beloved, I want you to notice right here, look whose womb God used as the earthly temple, the earthly sanctuary to be the Christotokos. You say, Pastor Joel, what's that? That's what the church historically always called the Christotokos, her womb, the Christ bearer. Would you say amen out there? She was the one God used to bring the Lord and Savior into the world. You listen to me now. It was not the womb of some royal queen that God used. It was not the womb of some royal princess or some dignitary that God used. It was not the womb of some celebrity, beloved. But rather, it was the womb of a poor and simple little teenage girl, Mary of Nazareth. You see, God not, did not choose some of the prominent or elite or regal erudite woman to carry the Christ child in their womb Instead, he chose Mary, beloved, and she was a humble and modest, little virtuous virgin, a little teenage girl. Beloved, everything I've ever read on this, saying she couldn't have been more than 14 tops, very tops, 15 years of age. And yes, God used her to bear that child in her womb, beloved, to morally and spiritually Bring that child. Beloved, she was so pure in God's sight. She loved the Lord so much. Listen to me, kids, that God took notice of her life. She found favor with God. Would you say amen out there? Oh, so many of us think, I'll, I'll, I'll make hay while the sun shines. I'll sow my wild oats while I'm a kid. And then when I get older, that's when I'll serve God. Bless God. That's not what Mary did. And God looked down and he saw her committed life. And God used her for his glory. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, who was it that God chose to be the surrogate father and the head of the household to morally and spiritually rear up and train up the Christ child? It was not some rich businessman that God used. It was not some politician or some nobleman. No, sir, beloved. It was a devout and decent man named Joseph, a humble and lonely carpenter from Nazareth, it says in verse number 4. And this lowly nail pounder from Nazareth, beloved, was divinely entrusted with the greatest privilege and responsibility of any man in the world ever had. You say, what's that? Namely, God chose him to raise up the Lord Jesus Christ. God chose him to protect and provide for the Son of God and also 
teach him and train him up in the scriptures so he can have great moral and spiritual convictions before God. Would you say amen out there? God said, Joseph, I want you to do it. I'm not going to turn it over to the Pharisee or to the rabbi or, or any of the scribes. You do it. Joseph, I want you to do it. You're the one that I've chosen. Oh, beloved, God did not entrust the great privilege and responsibility, I told you, to these scribes or Pharisees or rabbis or religious leaders or holy men in the temple. But God entrusted it to a little lowly carpenter from a poor and obscure town of Nazareth. And in so doing, the Bible says that God glorified himself. And folks, no wonder the Bible says in Psalm 29, 1 and 2, it exhorts us to give unto the Lord glory and strength. And then it says, give the Lord the glory due unto his name. In other words, beloved, little things glorify God. Would you say amen? Little things glorify God. I've seen it in the ministry. Little things that people do. It's easy to do the big things. Everybody sees you and they notice you, beloved. But it's when nobody's looking. It's when you're all alone. It's when you're giving money behind the scenes or going over and helping someone or making that phone call or when you're dead tired in the middle of the night and getting up and going over their house. Bless God, he sees those little things. Would you say amen out there? God never, ever overlooks that. You see, God chose the lowly Mary and the lowly Joseph of Nazareth to be the earthly parents of his son to bring him the glory and the praise and the honor and the love do his name. So what does it look like, Pastor? Well, it has the will to want to obey and glorify God like Mary and Joseph did. You know, she said to the Lord, Lord, let it be done to me as you will. Can you imagine a young girl never had uh, uh, li- uh, laid with a man, and there she is, got to go home and tell Mama and Daddy, Ma, Dad, I'm pregnant from the Lord. Now, I wouldn't want my daughter to come home and tell me that. I mean, I don't think I would believe it. How about you? And then how about going to her, her fiancé, Joseph, and saying, I know that we have only held hands and walked under the supervision of mom and dad, but I got something to tell you. I'm pregnant of the Lord. You what? You're telling me what? Come on, Mary. You think I was born yesterday? What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that's what love looks like. Love says, I will obey you, Lord. I'll glorify you, Lord. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what people say. What does love look like? It has the hands to help others and to help God like Mary and Joseph did. It has the feet, beloved, to hasten to the poor and the needy. What does love look like? It looks like it has the eyes to see the misery and the want of people and how they need a deliverer. And so you're willing to say, Lord, I'm willing to go through all of the pain, all of the heart all of the trial, all of the trauma, all of that, so man can be redeemed and have a deliverer. Oh, beloved, what does it look like? It has ears to hear the sighs and sorrow of hurting people, beloved. And you say, you know what, Lord? I know that if they only knew you, if they only knew you, and so you spend the time sharing the gospel with them. You see, beloved, that's what love really looks like. Not lust, like the world is putting forth. Not I love my family because they love me. Love, the agape love of God is to love the unlovable and do what it is He wants you to do. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, this is what biblical love looks like that brings glory to God. And it's been exemplified and personified in both Mary and Joseph of Nazareth. So what have I said to you on the point number one? I said, so God uses the little things like shepherds to glorify himself. I said, God uses the little things like Mary and Joseph to glorify himself. I'm saying God uses the little things like you and I to glorify himself. Not so much the big things, beloved, not the great things, not the huge things, but God uses the little things. Would you say amen out there? So the first thing we see is little things glorify God. In the second place, beloved, little things magnify God. Little things magnify God. I want you to look down at verse 7 again. It says, And she, Mary, brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Drop down to verse 12 and 13. 
and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. Now drop down to verse 20. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Folks, it's usually the little things that God uses to praise, exalt, and magnify himself. Now, when the angel Gabriel told Mary that she was chosen by God to be blessed with bearing the Christ child, she said this in the chapter before that, Luke chapter 1, verses 46 and 47. She said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. See, Mary, as good as she was, as much favor as she had before God. Mary was still a sinner because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, for there is none righteous, no, not one. So she called this babe in her womb, my Savior. Would you say amen out there? You see, Mary's my here could and should and would apply to all believers to join her in magnifying God, for he is also our Savior. If you're here today and you've been born again, you can say he is my Savior, amen, just like Mary did. So we too should praise the Lord like Mary. For Psalm 34, 3 says this, it says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And then he says, let us exalt his name together. Would you say amen? You hear me now. Little things show that God can and do a lot with these things. Yea, beloved, he can take the little things and do seemingly impossible things with the things that we call trivial, things that men have a tendency to overlook or take for granted. These little trivial things that we think are virtually unimportant in their life. In my life, I can just share this with you, beloved. I am the person, a type of a person, good, bad, or indifferent, as I have an eye for detail. I don't know if it came from when I was a private investigator or what it was, but from the martial arts to uh, nutritional science to being a pastor and a theologian, I have an eye for the small things. And those small things are like the links on a chain that hook everything else together. Even when I used to teach the martial arts, I used to tell everybody, you have to go back to the foundation. Never lose sight of the foundation. You can do all the other crazy things you want, but it's the foundational principles that you need to learn. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, listen to me now. Yet when Christ came into the world, he did not come to the hospital maternity ward. He did not come to some clean and sterile room. He did not come as a child born into a palatial surroundings with well-to-do parents. But he came in a manger, it says here. He came, beloved, with swaddling clothes and a dirty stable. And he was born not to rich, well-to-do people, but he was born unto peasants. Peasant people. Joseph was a carpenter. That was probably like a street sweeper around here today. So he wasn't a prominent person and neither was he. So this seems to be the way it always is with God. Amen. When he chooses to do something big, he uses little things. Well, let me ask you a question, beloved. What did he use to feed the 5,000? The Bible says he uses five little loaves and two little fishes. What did he use to give to uh, Samgar as a weapon to defeat and kill 600 Philistines? You know what the Bible says he used? An ox goad. A little ox goat. It's a little stick like this with a nail on the end of it that you'd prod the cattle in the rear end. Get going, get going. And yet God took that little ox goat and he said to Shamgar, you're going to defeat 600 well-armed, well-equipped Philistines, warriors. But I'm going to use you to work a miracle here and I'm going to get glory for myself. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, think about it. What did he have Samson use to slay 1,000 Philistines? The Bible says he used a little jawbone of an ass, a skeleton of a donkey that had rotted, the skin had rotted away, and all that was left was the bottom jawbone. And he picked it up, and he started swinging it. And one by one, the Philistines started falling like dominoes. Why? Because God uses the little things. Would you say amen out there? Beloved, you listen to me now. What did he give to Moses to part the Red Sea with? 
Was it a big golden rod? No. Was it a large, majestic wand that he could just wave over the waters? No, beloved, it wasn't that. Was it this huge, tall pole? No. The Bible says it was just a little crooked shepherd's staff. That's all it was. And he tapped it like that. And when he did it, God worked in him, with him, through him. And he miraculously and supernaturally split the Red Sea. Would you say amen out there? I'm saying God uses the little things. Amen. He uses the little fishes and loaves. He uses the ox goads. He uses the jaw bones. God uses the rods. Would you say amen out there? That's how he magnifies himself. And God uses simple people like you and I to magnify himself. You know, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. Now listen to what it says. It says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And God has chosen the base of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Like the, like the shepherds. And yea, the things which are not. Why do you do it, Lord? And Paul says, To bring to naught. The things that are. Folks, one of the most encouraging things of the Bible is that God uses little people and lowly people to do big tasks. So what are you saying to me, preacher? I'm saying I want you to be encouraged, little people, for God chooses us to do big things for Him. I want you to be encouraged, you who may be unlearned out there, or you who may be untrained out there. Those of you who say, God could never use me, I'm just an average person. I'm just a common person. You listen to me now. God uses people like you and me to do big things for himself. Would you say amen out there? Or if you think of the life of John the Baptist, beloved, think about it. He was wearing no flowing robes. He wasn't in the temple where everybody was following him. He wasn't eating a king's diet. Here he was. Everybody must have looked at him and laughed. He's living out in the wilderness, eating bugs and honey, locusts and honey. And yet when he started preaching, people realized that the hand of God was upon him. The Bible said the word of the Lord came unto John. And as he did, people started coming and flocking and flocking, beloved. God used the little things. Would you say amen out there? Here in the Christmas story, beloved, let me ask you something. Who was it that killed the giant Goliath? It was a little shepherd boy named David. Who was it that defeated the massive Midianite army of 30,000 men using only a little band of 300 men? Was it a man from the university? No. Beloved, was it a West Point graduate of that day? No. Uh -uh. Was it some special forces man that was trained in all the different combat arts? No, beloved, it wasn't that. What was it? It was little Gideon. And the Bible said God called him while he was hiding behind a wine press, threshing wheat, because he didn't want to go out and do it. And yet God said to him, you mighty man of valor. You see, God saw more than him than he saw in himself. Amen. And God sees more in you than you see in himself, because God has gifted you and graced you with his spirit. Would you say amen out there? So here's little Gideon. He was the runt kid of the runt family, of the runt tribe, from the runt nation. And God chose him to lead the little army and put to flight the huge army and enemy of God's people. And that's unbelievable to me. Every time I read the story, when, when Gideon surrounded the, the Philistines and he broke those uh, pots, beloved, and then lit the torches, he says, the, the sword of the Lord in Gideon. The sword of the Lord in Gideon, 300 men around this big valley, and there's 30,000 men in the middle of it. Now, I, that must have sounded like 15 million or something, right? Because everybody started dropping their swords, and the Bible said they committed mutiny. They started attacking one another. Why? Because God uses the little things. Beloved, who was it that led, led Israel out of Egypt or Egyptian bondage to the Promised Land, across the Red Sea upon bone dry ground? And who was it that went up on Mount Sinai and received the instructions for the tabernacle and the tables of stone which are engraved the laws of God? Who was it that did all this? I'll tell you who it was. It was a little boy named Moses who was placed in a little thatch ark, a little basket, and then a float, put a float upon the Nile River, beloved. And he was done by a poor, humble mother. Her name was Jochebed. 
And her little sister, his little sister Miriam said, I'll make sure that the Pharaoh's sister gets it so she can raise him up and he won't be killed. Now, beloved, you would think that God would have said to Pharaoh, listen, I want you to see something really special in this guy. Take him out of the Nile River and raise him as your son. Yet God didn't do that, did he? A little mother, a little basket, a little sister, a little luck. And beloved, ultimately, what does God do? He makes Moses the second in command of all of Egypt. Would you say amen out there? Beloved, let me ask you another question. Who was it that sent Naaman, the great Syrian general, to Elijah to be healed of his leprosy? Was it some important friend of his? Was it some government dignitary that said, this is where you need to go, Naaman? No, it wasn't. Beloved, was it some religious holy man that told him to do it? No. The Bible says it was a little captured Israelite maid who told him that there was a prophet in Israel who could heal him. Would you say amen out there? Beloved, a mighty miracle like that, and yet he'd have missed it all if it wasn't for a little maid that they had captured in Israel and said, you need to go see the prophet. Eli, he can do it for you. I'll tell you right now, I guarantee you. Beloved, listen to me. The entire Christmas story and all the Bible reminds us that God uses the little things, the little people, to do great big things for him. Beloved, who was it that gave food to feed the 5,000? You say, it was a little boy. Well, beloved, was it a local restaurant that fed the multitudes? Hey, listen, I want you to really order some more food here because we got a lot of people we got to feed. Beloved, was it the outstanding caterer of this day? We're going to cater this thing right now, you know. Was it the best chef who had the best cuisine? No, beloved, it was a little boy that had a little basket with five loaves and two fishes. And he said to Jesus, here's my lunch. And Jesus took his lunch and he blessed it. And bless God, he fed the multitudes. The Bible says there was 5,000 men besides women and children. Could have been 15,000 or more that were there that day. Amen. Hey, beloved, God uses the little things, the little people to do seemingly impossible things, the supernatural things, the mighty things, the miraculous things. Who was it that rimmed the Mediterranean Sea with the gospel? Beloved, who was it that took the gospel from Jerusalem, the Bible says, all through Asia Minor, and then the Bible went up into Europe on three missionary journeys and turned the world upside down for God? Was it a man of giant stature? No. Was it a man who was wealthy and had a lot of fame? No. Man who was good looking and muscular, he walked around like Apollos or Hercules. No way, beloved. The Bible says it was the Apostle Paul. And history tells us that he was a little bald headed Jew with a small and crooked physique and bad eyes and a squeaky voice like this. But Jesus loves you, you know, and you need to be born again. And you said, I'd have never killed a guy like that. I want a guy that can pronounce it, articulate, communicate the word of God. I want him to have someone that really can speak like Apollos. But God didn't use him, did he? God used the apostle Paul, and God used him to do big things. Beloved, let me ask you another question. Who was it that saw the resurrected Christ in his glory on that resurrection morning as we sing? Every resurrection Sabbath, up from the grave he arose with the mighty triumph of his foes. Well, beloved, who was it that first saw him? Was it some queen from the lavish surroundings? Uh-uh. Was it some princess with beautiful garments? No way. Was it some duchess of royalty? No, beloved. It was a commoner, and her name was Mary Magdalene, and she was once possessed with seven demons that Jesus had cast out of her. And Jesus said, I will appear to her. You see, she followed Jesus around. Her heart was toward the things of God. Her heart was to support Jesus. Her heart was loyal toward Jesus. And Jesus says, I'll be with her. And when they went to the cross, Mary was there, not Peter. Mary was there, beloved, not Andrew. Mary Magdalene. And she was there magnifying the Lord Jesus. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved Psalm 69, 30 wants you and I to say, I will praise the Lord with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Why? Because God uses the little things and God uses the little people. Beloved, who was it 
It was chosen as an object lesson of greatness in the kingdom of God by Jesus. Was it a king from the royal palace down the street? No. Beloved, was it the captain of an army? No. Was it a statesman from the government? No. Was it a wealthy man from the business community? No, I'll tell you who it was. Jesus took this little child and he set them in the midst. And he says, this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of God. People with childlike faith, people with childlike hearts want to serve the Lord. Jesus said, in my church, in my kingdom, they are the greatest. Why? Because I use the little things. Would you say amen out there? I use the little things. Don't you think that the little things that you do that no one else has seen you do that God has not seen you? You get that? <laughs> a lot of you think that. Well, if anybody only saw that I was sacrificing my last 10 bucks, I was doing this, I was doing that, God saw it. And you wonder why you were able to get that new car? You wonder why you were able to have that money to fix your car? You wonder why you were able to put oil in your tank? I'll tell you why, because God saw you do the little things. Only you didn't know that he was blessing you for that. What would you say, amen, out there? You see, beloved, it wasn't a king that God set in his midst, or a nobleman, or a statesman, or a rabbi, or a Pharisee. It wasn't some intelligentsia or a brainiac. It was nothing but a little boy. And God says that, you become like him, you'll be great in my church and in my kingdom. Now, beloved, that's what the Christmas story is all about. It's about the little things. There were little people like Mary and Joseph, little people like Simeon and Anna, little people, beloved, like shepherds and Zacharias. It doesn't read much like a great hall of fame, does it? You know, we're looking for the Tom Brady, and we're looking for this, you know, somebody that's pronounced like that, but that's not the way God thinks, beloved. He does his important work, his big work, through little things, doesn't he? So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. Here's your chance. Here's your chance, ordinary person, to be able to do extraordinary things for God. Your job won't matter one whit in the day of judgment. Your family, beloved, as good as they are, as much as you love them, won't matter half as much, a quarter as much, one centiller as much as what you do for the Lord. You hear me now, but you say, preacher, I'm the one my family said would be least to succeed. Yeah, that's what they said about David. And you say, preacher, I'm not a person who can speak very well. Uh-huh, neither could Moses. But God used him, didn't he? And you say, preacher, I'm just a little runt, and I'm not, very, I'm not strong enough. Mm. So wasn't Gideon, and so wasn't the apostle Paul, yet God used those two weaklings, amen? You say, preacher, I'm always sickly. Very well. Well, neither was Timothy. The Bible said he had to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake and his often infirmity so he could serve the Lord. Now, he didn't walk around like this, okay? And the wine of that day wasn't 18% like it is today. It was mo probably no more than 4 to 6 uh, percent. That's why the Bible says, Who hath sorrow, who hath woe? In Proverbs chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, He that tarrieth long at the wine. You had to be drinking all day long in them days to be able to get high. And beloved, you may say, I'm a person who doesn't have the gifts. How can I minister? I don't have the gifts. I don't have any education. I don't have any training. Neither did Peter. Peter was a fisherman, and yet God chose him as head of the apostolic college when they walked this earth. Would you say amen out there? I'm simply saying that God in his wisdom has chosen to use the little people. God uses little things, beloved. So little people, here's your chance to serve the Lord. I'm saying God in his wisdom has chosen you like he does Mary and Joseph. And you hear me now. Bless God, beloved. This may be your one and only chance right now to serve the Lord. If you were to die today, you would say, what did I do for the Lord? Oh, I did this, I did that, I satisfied my life, I, I did all of this, but I didn't serve the Lord. Would you say amen out there? And this may be your only chance to do it. Scripture says in Psalm 74, Let all things that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee, and let such as love thy salvation say continuously, Let God be magnified. I'm telling you that little things magnify God. So God uses little things. You know, God doesn't use people. 
it's not very often that I see some of the most anointed men I've ever known have not had much training. Some of the greatest preachers I have ever seen, beloved, didn't have much talent or even much tact. They said don't when they should have said doesn't. They said ain't when they should have said what? <laughs> I'm one of those little things. So <laughs> I knew I'd beat you, Cheryl. Why, beloved? Why did God use these men? They weren't really gifted because God says, I want to give myself glory and I'll tell you who I'm going to do it through. I'm going to do it through that little preacher, the one everybody laughs at, the one everybody mocks at. He's not too handsome. He's not too smart. He's not too educated. But bless God, he's mine. Would you say amen? I'm going to use the little things, the little things, the little things. God used little people, little things in the Christmas story. Beloved, think about this. At that time in Palestine, there were great big palaces of beauty and splendor in Palestine. I remember doing a research paper on that one time. And there were great mansions and estates with the most plush furnishings and elaborate decor. And there were great hotels and inns, even though they were booked now for this time of the year, for the wealthy travelers. Yet when our Lord Jesus Christ came into the world, beloved, he didn't come to any such things. The scripture says he didn't come to any luxurious places or palaces like this. What did he come to? The Bible says he came to a soiled stable and a little manger and a little town called Bethlehem is prophesied. The city of bread. Micah 5.2 it said this, But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. Now, beloved, that was important that we understand that prophecy. Why? I'll tell you why. There was another city called Bethlehem. It was Bethlehem Nef uh, Nephthali, excuse me, that was a thriving and wealthy metropolis inhabited, inherited, inhabited by many rich and erudite and urbane type of a people. It was striving, but God says, I'm not bringing him to Bethlehem Nephtali. I'm bringing him to Bethlehem Ephrata, a poor city, an obscure city, something you thought nothing good would come out of. That's where I'm going to bring my Messiah from. You know, some of the best churches that I've ever seen are not big, big churches. You don't see too many big churches today that are preaching the Word of God. The little churches like this that God has, amen? They're the ones that have kept the faith alive down through the centuries. Well, everyone else has departed. Woe unto them, the Bible says, as they've departed. You see, beloved, God loves to use the little things like stables and man uh, mangers. God loves to use little things like maidens. Hey, you know what? I think I'll announce my Messiah to the shepherds. Nobody really likes them. And you know, they're probably not going to believe them, but I know what I'm going to do through them. And you know, God loves to use little things like carpenters. And little babies, beloved. Listen, bless God, it's the little things of Christmas that what this story really is all about. Amen? Now, does God ever use rich men? Yeah, he does sometimes. Does God ever use um, intelligent and erudite people and strong and educated people? He does sometimes, but most of the time he can't use them. Why? Because they're all puffed up with themselves. You see, they think more highly of themselves than they ought to think, the scripture tells us, and they're full of themselves. So God can't and won't and does not use them. So God uses the little things because it's really not our ability, it's our availability to God. Amen? When God called me, beloved, I knew, I knew God had called me. I don't know why, I, honest to this day, I don't know why he called me to be a preacher. I don't. I don't know why to this day he called me to be a pastor. I don't, but I know he called me because I was willing to drop everything that I had and say, okay, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. Now, if I know the road was going to be like this, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> okay? But I knew the hand of God was upon me. I can remember one time, I, uh, I had my health food store downtown, and uh, it was noontime, and I had been reading the Bible, and around noontime it kind of slowed down a little bit. So I put a sign up, gone fishing, and I took a walk. And everybody knew I'd be back because that's the way it kind of worked out. I remember walking down the street, and I was going down um, toward the waterfront, and there was nobody on that street. It's a one-way street coming up the hill by Coles Hill there. Anyways, I was walking down there. I remember saying, Lord, I don't know what you've got for me, 
but I do know I feel your hand upon me. What is it you want? I'll do whatever you want for me. Well, 40 years later, God brought, I said to God one day I came home, everybody's mad at me, nobody likes the decisions I make, I scratch them where it itches when I preach, and I remember going out in the woods, I said, this is what you call me for? He says, hey, remember that little prayer? <laughs> Beloved, I heard that voice as, as clear as you hear mine today. He says, remember that little prayer that you prayed that you're willing to do anything I want you to do? Yeah, I want you to know, Pastor Joel, I'm going to use you to scratch everybody right where they itch. And I've been doing it. <laughs> I've tried to preach the truth as God has revealed it to me, good, bad. And it's never been indifferent, I'll tell you that. So what are you saying? I'm saying, beloved, have you made yourself available to God? God uses little things to glorify himself, to magnify himself. And let me close with this. God uses the little things to typify himself. I won't go to the scriptures just to save some time. But using little people, little things is just like God, beloved. I want you to think about this. He used a borrowed room for the Last Supper. He used an upper room for the 120 disciples to meet in at Pentecost. He used a basket and bulrushes of the Nile to protect his deliverer. He used a burning bush to call Moses. He used the rod to split the Red Sea. He used the raven to feed Elijah. Beloved, people don't see the truth of that story. You see, ravens were considered unclean. And yet here's Elijah. There's no water, no food. Did God send a clean bird? No. What does God do? He sends a raven, an unclean bird, with a huge piece of meat. And he drops it off. And the bird said, ah, tweet, 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 tweet. Eat it and shut up. <laughs> Now, beloved, can you imagine that? See, there's no clean or unclean before God except he, when he says it, beloved, and it was ceremonial under the law. Would you say amen out there? And then think about Elijah, beloved. He goes to the uh, prophet, the school of the prophets, and the, uh, the people are chopping down trees. The prophets are chopping down trees to make the school bigger, and all of a sudden that borrowed axe head falls into the water. And they said, Elijah, Elijah, master, master, the axe head, the axe head is gone. Elijah comes over. He says, where to go? They said, right down in there, down deep in there. He got a stick. They said, yes, sir. They said, throw it in the water. He threw it in the water, and what happened? The axe head <laughs> floats up to the top, reconnects to the stick. He says, now get to work. How about when they were gathering all of the herbs. Uh, they were going to have a big meal for the prophets, beloved. And they went out into the woods and they, gra they gathered all these wild herbs and everything. And then, beloved, they stirred it up and they said, time to eat. And the prophets come over and they said, wait a minute, there's poison in this pot. There's poison in this pot. Elijah, you got any salt? And they said, well, yeah. He says, throw it in and eat. I would have said, after you. <laughs> Wouldn't you? You see, what am I saying to you? I'm saying God uses the little things. Beloved, God used a pagan named Abraham to build a nation and be the spiritual father of all who believed. God used a cross to save the world. God used a Stephen to save a Paul. God used a dungeon so Paul could write most 13, perhaps 14 if he wrote the book of Hebrews of the New Testament epistles. And beloved, it's the typical of God to use these little things and I'll tell you another thing. God used a baby, not a bomb, to rock and shock the world and world history. Would you say amen out there? I'm saying the Christmas story is about the importance of little things. Bless God, he knows when a little sparrow falls to the ground. And bless God, beloved, he knows all the hairs on your head. And some of you, he doesn't have to count very high. And beloved, he knows every idle word that we speak. Now I'm closing, so listen. God pays close attention to the smallest and minutest details in our life. And to those who humble themselves in his sight, he knows he can use for his glory because God uses the little things. Now in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, I'm not going to have you go there. And in verse 38, we see Mary in the announcement. God says, you found favor with me. Why, Mary? Because you're a humble little girl. Why, Mary, because you live a holy and a righteous and a godly life before me? Why, Mary, because you submit to my will? And so, therefore, because you've done that, 
and you found favor in my sight, I'm going to use you to bring the Messiah into the world. Now the question is this, how do we find favor with God? Now listen carefully. God doesn't need any big thing for you to do. What God really wants is for you to yield the little things in your life, just like Mary and Joseph did. That's what God needs from you. Romans 6 is all about that. Yielding yourself, reckoning yourself dead. Not self on the throne, Jesus on the throne. What would you say, man, out there? But you say, Pastor, I'm not very talented. You don't have to be talented. You say, Pastor, I'm not very smart. I know that, but you don't have to be smart. You know, oh, you're smart, you're listening to me. Or not smart. <laughs> you say, Pastor, I'm not very big. You don't have to be big. How big was the Christ child when God became flesh, beloved? I'm saying the Christmas story and the Christmas faith is built all around little people with big hearts who live in little places and who do little tasks with little things for the glory of God. Now pay close attention, please. The beginning of either our faithfulness or our unfaithfulness in our life always begins with whether or not God sees us doing those little things that he puts before us. You see, God uses the small details in our life to test us, to try us, to see if we're worthy enough to do the big things for him. Just like I would test you. Just like you would test your employee. God uses these little things, and he says, I'm going to see. And a lot of people say, well, when the big things come along, that's when I'll do it. Hey, beloved, you want to know what? Jesus t said, if God can't trust you with the little things, the, the unrighteous mammon, how is he going to trust you with the big things of the kingdom? If he can't trust you with the little money, beloved, you won't tithe, you won't help people out, you won't do How is he going to trust you with the big things of the kingdom? So what am I saying? I say you need to pay attention to the small details in your life because God's in them. And he's watching. And he wants to use you. He wants to use all of us little people. You don't have to have a great big ministry, beloved. He may not call you to a great big job for him, but he says in 1 Thessalonians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, that it's encountered of a steward that he be found faithful. Amen. Whatever it is God has called you to, you be faithful. People can't even be, the MIAs, missing in attendance, can be faithful to God at church. Don't show up for Sabbath school. Don't show up for prayer meeting. Barely show up for morning service. MIAs, missing in attendance. And yet God says, I see all that. And you're saying, oh, I want to be used to you, God. These big things. And God says, I can't even trust you with the little things. You say, but if you don't understand. I'm so tired. Wednesday night comes, I'm tired. So am I. So it wasn't Jesus. The Bible says he even slept. But God says he tests us with those little things. Amen. Why? Because God uses the little things. The question is this, beloved. Will God find you faithful? Will he find me faithful? God uses us little things. And Merry Christmas to you. Let's go to the throne.